Try to get to text her. Oh, here she comes. Hi, Megan. I always forget to turn the video part on so that I can <laughs> on the internet and start over. I'm going to open our, our meeting tonight, uh, Tiger Tualatin School District Budget Committee meeting. And um, I want to welcome everybody and especially our new budget committee members. Um, that's uh, Jimmy and um, Kristen and uh, uh, I guess just Jimmy and, and uh, Kristen. So welcome. Um, so I wanted to ask, first of all, if um, the superintendent, Dr. Sue, if there's any changes to the agenda. There are none. Okay. The agenda is approved as presented. Um, I mean, does, do we have a motion to um, approve the agenda? I move to approve the agenda as presented. Okay. We have a motion to um, approve the agenda. All in agreement? Say aye. Um, I'll go down the list since I have to get a tally. Um, so, Director Bowman? Aye. Is that an aye? Yep. Okay, thanks. Uh, Director Emerson? Aye. Um, Director Wolf? Yes, aye. Uh, Director Zerchmi? Aye. Um, budget Committee Member Jimmy Brown? Aye. Uh, committee Member Octavio Gonzalez? Aye. Uh, committee Member Megan Madlum? Aye. Uh, and Committee Member Chris Miles? Aye. And Corey Morgan? Aye. Okay. Approved as presented. So at this time, um, we are going to um, elect officers or an officer um, to start with, um, the presiding officer to start with. And um, just for the record, does not need a second motion. So I'm welcoming right now a nomination for the presiding officer, the, um, the chair of the budget committee. I'll nominate Megan Medlam to be the presiding officer for the 2021 budget committee. Okay. Does not need a second. So I'm gonna ask for a vote. So again, I'm gonna go down the list. Um, I, I assume you accept this nomination. Yes. Megan? <laughs> uh, all right. So, Director Bowman. Aye. Uh, Director Anderson? Aye. Director Fox is aye. Director Zerchmi? Aye. Uh, committee member um, Jimmy Brown? Aye. Octavio Gonzalez? Aye. Megan Madlin? Aye. Kristen Miles? Aye. And Corey Morgan? Aye. Okay, congratulations. Congratulations, Megan. You're now the presiding uh, officer, and I'm going to pass the gavel over to you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, so, number one is to nominate the vice presiding officer. I'll nominate Corey Morgan to be the vice presiding officer if he wants it. I accept. Okay. And uh, we'll do a roll call for the vote. Um, we'll start with Director Bowman. Aye. Okay. Um, Director Zershmi. Aye. Uh, Director Emerson. Aye. Uh, Director Fox. Aye. And Director Wolf. She's not here today. Not here today. Okay. She'll, she'll be joining us at seven. I should have announced that at the beginning. She's um, at another commitment tonight until seven o'clock. Actually, an OSBA um, meeting that. Um, so great opportunity. Anyway, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, she's not here today. Thank you. Until seven. Um, Corey Morgan. Aye. Uh, Jimmy Brown. Aye. Kristen Miles. Aye. And Octavia Gonzalez. Aye. All right. So welcome, Corey, as the vice presiding officer. Um, the next part of our agenda is the budget message from David Moore. 
Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to share our budget message for the 2021 budget. And I'm going to share my screen with the PowerPoint presentation. And it may help uh, to minimize feedback if you mute, if you're not speaking at the time. I probably didn't finish that statement, but yeah, please mute. Can everyone see, can somebody let me know if they can see the, the presentation document? Yes, we can see it. Thank you, Director Zershmeed. Get this set up as a slideshow and get going. It's like I'm already to the end. So it probably goes without saying that this uh, budget development cycle has been like no other um, during my career and, and probably um, like no other for Tiger Twalton School District during modern times. We started off with, with tremendous momentum in the fall, in the winter, as we convened our SIA work group to develop our priorities for the student investment account dollars. And um, and then in late um, or mid mid March, we were hit um, with the impacts of of COVID nineteen and had to we re reverse direction a little bit on how uh, we were um, approaching our budget development. Um, so to start out, I'll just give a, a little bit of overview of what the what's included in the budget message and what I'm going to address this evening. And um, we've seen a huge impact on the Oregon economy due to COVID-19. So we'll uh, mention uh, a little bit about that, including uh, this morning, we had uh, the June uh, economic forecast and revenue update. And uh, several of us listened to that. And we have um, the latest information on what the revenue looks like on an ongoing basis for the state and how that might impact the state school fund and Tiger Tualatin. Um, we'll talk about our budget assumptions and what went into uh, putting uh, certain the, the primary revenue and expenditure numbers into the, the general fund, especially and uh, also talk about state funding uh, related to those assumptions and um, how, uh, as I mentioned, a shortfall uh, could impact that, that state funding when it comes to the state school fund and how uh, the district will respond to that in the future going into uh, next month and even the summer. And um, remind everyone of our district priorities that we always pay attention to as we're developing the budget and prioritizing resources. And also there's um, always um, a lot of dialogue and questions about reserves. So we'll give an overview and update on that. And then um, what is the timing of a special legisl legislative session where the legislature will consider um, the shortfall that's communicated to them and how they will adjust uh, state budgets accordingly, including the state school fund. So with that, I'll move forward with the presentation. I mentioned the economy and the updates we've heard um, recently, including this morning. And um, we've kind of fell in love with this diagram or image um, at both at the business manager and superintendent level. I know Dr. Sue likes to talk about it and we like to talk about it internally, but um, typically, and you may have heard this um, from the 
the Federal Reserve's chair comments earlier this week. Um, typically, um, economists speak in terms of a, a U or a V-shaped recovery uh, when there is an economic downturn. And uh, that's what this is um, portraying here, a couple different options. You'll see the, the solid red line, and that is um, the initial severe recession drop that we're in right now and not even sure if we hit bottom yet. But um, if you recall back in February, we set low um, records for low unemployment rates uh, in Oregon of, of 3%. Uh, just this week, they announced that we've uh, reached 14% due to job loss. And um, the idea is, um, this, there's a new phrase is, that has been coined with this image and that uh, more of a square root recovery um, possibility where you have, after the uh, severe initial drop, you have initial bounce, bounce back after restrictions are lifted. So they've been talking about phases of reopening the economy and day-to-day -day life. And that's when perhaps you would see uh, that initial bounce back. So you see the, the bolded red line with the, the initial jump back up. And then um, you get to a certain spot, you know, where you're clearly well under um, the 0% line, but that, that is where we were before uh, the impacts of COVID-19 back in uh, February. And um, once, once we have a sense of uh, potential um, health crisis becoming under control, then we, we might see some slow growth. And then from there, there's two paths. You could see more of a V-shape recovery where it's quicker. And um, the other option, of course, is the longer term recovery where it's more of a U-shape. And that growth depends on the amount of pent up demand and when consumers want to get out there and start spending money again and potentially making money again. And um, other consideration is what permanent damage has been done and what is the policy to address uh, these issues, including the permanent damage. So um, what I added um, to the slideshow with the updated version we sent over about uh, 325 this afternoon was what uh, the economist shared this morning in the update, and that's the next slide. Um, so there's a couple um, URLs uh, referenced in the title page or the title of this page. And the first one is um, a good resource if you're interested in, in listening to the, the perspective of the state economist. Uh, from time to time, they post articles or blogs here on, on this particular web page. And this, this actual graph is taken from there. Plus, it was in their presentation today when they gave their update to the, the subcommittee on revenue for the legislature. And then the second URL is um, has the complete uh, set of documents related to the, the update, including um, their slideshow and uh, a summary, an executive summary of the overall uh, forecast and revenue update. Um, but just to touch, touch on this image a little bit, it, it gives you a better idea of the timelines that are be con being considered on one hand. On the other hand, uh, the lines outside of the, the solid red lines are uh, images of other recessions and the period of recovery for those particular recessions. Um, the dip that we're seeing in that initial drop, it's, it's like, as far as loss of jobs, it's no other since we've seen since the Great uh, Depression in 1939. And um, the difference uh, as far as the outlook of the economists um, for the 2020 recession is compared to the Great Recession 2007 is a, a recovery period that's not quite as long, although it is long. Um, you'll see that uh, if you can read 
Um, it might be easier to read in your own copy if you have that open. Uh, but at the end, just under the end of that line, um, where where it says under where it says 2020, uh, you'll see back to peak in 2024 uh, second quarter is what that's saying. So that's when, um, given the jobs that have been lost during this two month period, that's it'll take four years to get the number of jobs back. And um, I'm not going to, I could spend a whole presentation just on this economic update, but we're not going to do that this evening. That's why we gave you the reference materials. There's several reasons due to that, given that long term uh, projected recovery. Um, the good news is it's not as long as 2007. Uh, the bad news is, is it's, it's still, we're almost um, mid decade before we see full recovery as far as the number of jobs. I'm going to pause for a second. Question? Yep. Do you want me to hold them till the end? Or no, uh, I'm going to pause once in a while and okay. just for that purpose to, to consider questions. Okay. So is it safe for me to equate um, our expected revenues with our uh, percent change in employment? Can I expect a similar percent change in revenue? Not necessarily. We're going to talk about the revenue later, okay. and that might answer some of your questions that are popping up in your head right now, Director okay. Zoshmin. Thanks. So let's talk about some of the assumptions, and these are on a pre-COVID basis. Um, and just to remind everyone, um, we're responsible for uh, developing a budget and having that adopted and submitted to the different agencies by July 1. Even with COVID-19, there's no exceptions there. Um, plus, um, local budget law expects us to uh, develop a budget based on uh, the best reasonable estimates that we currently have available. And other state um, guidance is recommending that. So the budget that you have been presented in proposed form is still based on a $9 billion state school fund for the current biennium and allocating 51% of those dollars to districts in um, 2021. So um, that covers much of our revenue. And on the expenditure side, uh, the expenditures include uh, current service level, uh, expenditures based on current service level for staffing and contracted services, and also including any contractual increases. And the other assumption that's here is uh, full funding and reserves, and we'll talk a little bit about that later, but um, full funding and reserves based on board policy plus uh, one and a half million uh, remains reserved for the art rec and elementary opening. And that's the, the same number uh, we had a year ago reserved uh, in the current year budget. So uh, some highlights about the state school fund. Um, the state school fund formula amount of one, 132.8 million is included in the budget. And um, that includes both the dollars that come from the state directly and then uh, primarily our, our local property taxes, uh, in addition to the other revenue sources that are part of the full formula. And um, that number uh, was released. It's the one and only number that's been released by the Department of Education back in February 26. Again. This estimate at the time was based on that $9 billion biennial number, 51%. Again, uh, prior to any impact of, of uh, revenue losses under COVID-19. Uh, what makes up that $132.8 million? Uh, we have extended ADMW for, projected for next year of $14,662. A uh, key update there, it's, it's greater than uh, the estimate for the current year. And so that means uh, we're off our hold harmless. The extended part of the, the formula means that we compare uh, the current year um, estimated ADMW with the prior year and whatever's larger is the number you use. 
And so in the current year, we were actually using uh, the 1819 estimated or actual ADMW. Um, the other piece of that is 132.8 million divided by 14,662 is an amount per ADMW of $9,060. So um, one to point out, you know, the ins and outs of ADMW, and I pointed out the page numbers where you can see the worksheets uh, from the Oregon State School Fund within your budget document. If you have a printed document, it's on pages XV and XVI. So XV has uh, the components of the formula, including uh, the local revenue sources, the transportation costs. Uh, the experience rating on teachers, um, these high-level numbers of the ex extended ADMW and the amount per ADMW uh, to give you all the elements that make up um, the pieces to get to that 132.8 million. Um, also, if you don't have a printed document, you could see uh, this on pages 26 and 27. The second page of each uh, page number sequence listed here is the, the pieces that make up the, ex the extended ADMW amounts, include the additional weightings for special education, ELL, et cetera. This is a very complex formula, so I'm going to, if there's any specific questions, I'm going to pause for a few seconds here to see if we have any questions. We have other funds. And this, just, just a, and it may be a question I might just ask a little bit later. But does the um, in the budget section itself, does the early retirement comp impact the cost factor for experience rating that's computed by the state? So, so we have an experience rating of X percent or whatever that is used mm -hmm. by the state to resources. Does early retirement, so meaning that we would lose staff, say, if we left for early retirement, would that impact that number? Well, if the people, the individuals who have left, um, already left the district could impact the number if they had, if they, um, you know, had a large number of years of experience and then if they dropped off, um, then it's going to reduce um, that experience rating factor. Does that make? Is that what you're asking, Jimmy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because then that 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 impacts then uh, resources coming in because we get some money based on the experience that we have in our workforce. Correct. So if a percentage of that workforce leaves, then that impacts the available resources. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right. So the concept is, is um, if they have more experience, likely you're paying them more. So there is an offset on the revenue side. Right. Okay. Thank you. Good question. Um, David, I have a question. Um, uh, the 2019-20 ADMW for the 1920 budget was 14489 Um and in the budget doc, the current budget doc, budget document, it's talking about um, some cost savings and some extra money that we have. But with the variance in the ADMW between the budgeted revenue um, at 2019-2020 and then what we're showing in this document, has that change in budgeted revenue been accounted for? So you're talking about the current year, Megan? Yes. Yeah, so um, what we've done, and we'll talk about the ending fund balance number that reflects a beginning fund balance uh, next year or in the 2021 budget. So um, we've, we've gotten updates from the ODE during the year uh, related to 2019-20 state school fund. So yeah, any updates we've received from that, we've um, increased revenue in the current year. So that's going to impact our ending fund balance in the current year on a positive basis. So we've taken that into account. Okay, thank you. Yep.
We also have, um, of course, our other um, significant dollars uh, outside of the general fund included included in the budget. Um, the SIA, the student investment account, is budgeted at the full allocation of ten point one million, and uh, you can find the detail for that budget on page point fifty one of your printed document or page 88 of the PDF. And this includes uh, FTE of total FTE of 79.25. And just to remind everyone that's funded with the corporate activity tax. So those dollars um, are not excluded from any uh, economic downturn impact. And I'll mention um, what we learned about the potential impact on corporate activity tax this morning from The Economist. Um, and in the meantime, um, we're building contingency plans at uh, 25, 50, and 75% levels of funding. And just to, to mention briefly um, what we learned today, and this is very preliminary information because the information that The Economist released, um, state leaders and business officials uh, take the, the information released by The Economist. And we, we did our, our own um, group work in determining what's, what's the impact uh, down to the, the K-12 level. So uh, what we basically what we've learned so far is that um, corporate activity tax will st still be at, a, at about 60% of the levels expected as far as the revenue collected for the biennium which was um, we were internally, we were hoping, you know, in the 25 to 50% uh, level of funding. So we'll keep close tabs on that because that's brand new information. And we want to make sure um, some of the assumptions that are made um, because there's uh, involvement with state level leaders and connections to the, the governor's office. And um, the other the other caution here is, are they going to use potentially any of the, the corporate activity tax additional dollars? Right now, there's um, about $600 million going into the state school fund from um, the, the CAT tax. And if there's given the shortfall they're expecting in the state school fund, are they going to potentially shift more dollars over um, for, of the CAT tax to the state school fund? So stay tuned stay tuned and a lot of this will depend on um, decisions made at the legislative level and we'll we'll share information new information as we learn um, also the high school su success funds are budgeted at, at 4.2 million uh, you can find the detail on page 55 of the printed document or page 91 of the pdf and again um, the cat tax uh, it was expected to, um, on a biennial basis, bring $133 million uh, for full funding of the, the Student Success Act of $303 million. And uh, so we're expecting um, a shortfall there based on the assumptions, even though we've budgeted it at the full amount. Um, and our contingency plans for reductions are uh, in increments of 10% up to 30%. What we learned today on a preliminary, preliminary, ba preliminary basis is, is we'll likely see 25 to 30% reductions in the ballot measure 98 or the high school success funds. David, this is Octavio. Octavio. I have a question. Can you talk a little bit about if, if there's time, what does the contra contractual increases mean and what's the impact of those, those dollars being spent? So contractual increases would, would mean, uh, you're talking about on the expenditure side back on one of the earlier slides, I assume, yes. Octavio. Yes. So um, on the, the personnel and staffing side, we have... Um, we have collective bargaining, bargaining agreements uh, with our employee groups, and uh, we have a contract um, with the classified group um, for the next two years. But all other groups, we don't we don't have any contract going forward. 
So um, we made assumptions in the budget to account for both the um, both the classified contract, the, the contractual increases that are reflected in that contract, both on the COLA side and the, the step side and, and the, the benefit side of things. And then we made some assumptions for the other groups. Sure. Um, on the contractual increases, is there a potential consideration of not moving on the contractual increases? Yeah, we're going to talk about um, towards the end of the presentation how we might have to, things we might have to consider to address a shortfall, a revenue shortfall. Okay, thank you. You bet. Speaking of shortfall, so um, this table I put in here to give you some perspective, um, different ranges of revenue shortfall at the state level, and then uh, keep in mind that the state school fund is 38% of the state general fund and lottery funds budget, and uh, Tiger Tualatin is, is approximately 2%, a little over 2%. Uh, probably when everything's said and done of the state school fund. So if we were to have, for instance, a $1 billion shortfall at the state uh, when it comes to general fund revenues, um, that would mean a $380 million loss of state school fund monies and uh, just uh, over seven and a half or $7.6 million loss to Tiger Tualatin. Um, or just under 5% of our general fund total expenditures uh, in the proposed budget of 157.3 million. So what we what we heard today on a again on a very preliminary basis and there there is a couple of assumptions uh, along the way to interpret um, the impact on the state school fund and then on on Tiger Twalton is um, there the shortfall um, that was shared um, following the forecast um, that would hit the general fund budget is about $800 million. And if uh, the state school fund remains at 38% of the state budget, that is a, a state school fund loss of $308 million. And uh, the Tiger Twalton uh, revenue loss would be about $6.5 million. So um, we'll continue to have meetings the rest of the week um, at, the, at the state level with the school business managers. And I'm sure Dr. Sue will be huddled up with superintendents and her COSA group and ODE group. And we'll do the same on the business manager side and we'll, we'll um, get final refinement of these numbers, but those are the preliminary numbers. And um, wanted to make sure the committee um, knew about those uh, this evening, and um, that's a, the starting point of what we're working with. What we don't know is, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the things the legislature has to consider when they, they convene for a special session. We don't know at what point, um, given that $800 million shortfall, they've applied some reserves or have they applied um, maybe some federal revenue that we're expecting or hoping for an additional revenue package from the federal government. So those are some of the things we have to unpack and unwind. Any questions on shortfall? Yeah, I've got a quick question. So when you talk about the $800 million shortfall, because the news today that, that I heard from, from my organization was a $2.7 billion. Yep. That's overall, I know that's not just state school funds. So when you say 800 million, the other thing that I also heard was that that was also, that's kind of an inflated number based on increased revenue projections that were unallocated by the legislature and are somewhat offset by the projected new decreases. So is that the 800 million that you're talking about or is 800 million state school fund only? The 800 million is what... Um, what, where that number is coming from is from COSA, the state yeah. administrators association. So, um, and we don't, we don't have the backstory on it, unfortunately, okay. at this time. That's why I said there's a lot of unpacking, a lot of unwinding. Okay. We don't know if they're, 
applying some of the revenue, perhaps part of the Education Stability Fund, but mm -hmm. they can't do that without legislative approval. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of questions at this point. Um, and um, we're actually, as a group, surprised that it wasn't a larger shortfall, especially, again, we saw the $2.7 billion number also as part of the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so stay tuned, like I said, um, we'll continue to unpack that and get more information. So we have to make sure we're um, working with accurate numbers going forward, which in reality, you know, we'll talk about the legislative session, but we won't have an accurate number for a while. Um, given the time frame that we're hearing for that special session. Thank you. Interestingly, the, um, the meeting I was on prior to this, um, Elizabeth Steiner Hayward was on, and she mentioned a number of 950 million um, and was talking about the Ed Stability Fund and the Rainy Day Fund, um, and that they, those were not folded into that not to make that number. So that okay. the 400 million or so in the Stability Fund would be available. If I understood that, it correctly. There's actually 800 million right now projected in the stability fund for the end of the biennium. So maybe they're having it. I don't know. So there was something yeah, there's a lot of the, there's a lot of um, speculation at this point for sure. There's something about there's the 40 or 40 percent of it or something like that could be used in any one year. I think it's what or two fifths or something like that. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it, the whole amount. Would have been 1.6 billion, and so yeah, uh, a quarter of it can be used in any one given year. So 400 million. Yeah, the 1.6 would be both the rainy day fund and the and stability the fund. And she was talking about a June legislative session, just for the record. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna talk about that here in a second, also. So. Um, Someone asked earlier about, you know, our strategy moving forward and um, reminder to everyone that um, when we consider budget adjustments that 85% of our general fund is staffing and personnel. So there's a number, uh, a handful of things uh, that could be considered um, when we're talking about reductions to the budget and um, one is furlough days. Um, historically, we haven't done furlough days in Tiger Walton during the Great Recession, one of the few districts that did not, but that's a, an option. And um, there will be uh, changes to staffing levels and um, also compensation benefit levels would be uh, considered. <laughs> and then on the discretionary spending side, uh, department leaders have been directed to prepare scenarios of five to 10 and 15% reduction, excuse me. One other um, outside of the box thing we're doing in Tiger Walton is uh, cabinet and department leaders are currently going through a program inventory process. So that um, means evaluating current program, uh, both looking at both uh, student outcomes and how we measure those student outcomes uh, relative to um, the amount of money we spend on that particular program. So the, the simple question of, are we getting the best bang for a buck for that program? And if we're, if evidence shows that perhaps we're not, do we want to um, consider doing something else with that investment or, um, sunset the program or maintain the program, uh, depending on the cost and um, the impact. And so we're in parallel with our budget process, we've been working on this program inventory and we hope to have um, some conclusions um, to share, uh, at least in, in a first stage um, around mid-June. And we're also going to involve our principals in that, um, to getting some feedback from them on answering questions about specific programs and how they're used with their own buildings. 
and also ask them to consider if the program is being used during distance learning. And we're looking forward to the outcomes of this process to see if it will um, help us with any budget decisions going forward. The other, the other thing to consider uh, for budget implications is the impact of COVID-19 and distance learning and the possibility of, of ongoing impact in next school year, which is real. Um, perhaps we, we see a, a hybrid model uh, related to teaching and learning and where attendance is staggered and that can have an social distancing can have an impact on um, bus service and meal service and, and classrooms. And so that'll, that's an, an additional item. And we just got fresh guidance in the last week from the ODE on this. So we're trying to uh, look at that and see um, what some of the impacts could be uh, for next school year. Any good? Uh, regarding the cut percentage scenarios and discretionary spending, so will the district use its equity lens to, to review the potential cuts? And would there be an opportunity to utilize any of the different committees that have been in play uh, during the SIA uh, and community budget workshop groups? Um, to weigh in on, as stakeholders, to weigh in on any potential impact that might come up that would at least be entertained by the district. Great segue, Jimmy. Um, we're going to talk about district priorities and how that those will impact our decisions. And we aim to stay true to our principles. Um, including in our strategic plan, including our commitment to equity in all students. And also our, um, as you know, our strategic financial plan is the concept of aligning use of resources with district goals. So we will uh, aim our hardest to, to straight, stay true to that. Um, and uh, as far as getting input, from our, our community groups. Uh, for sure, um, just to remind everyone, uh, you should have just, uh, those of you who are involved in the, the process for developing the student investment account priorities, we're having a, a short meeting next Tuesday to get input from the group as to how we prioritize. Um, we're looking in terms of quarter amount of investments. So if we receive 25% of the funds, 50, 75, and so forth. And we wanna share uh, some of our thinking so far because that, that thought, thought process has also been impacted by um, the impacts of distance learning and how school is likely to, to look different in uh, the future, including next school year. Um, okay. Yes. I, if I might also add just one, one um, item here uh, to Jimmy's question. Uh, I think, Jimmy, what, when you see that, that I've directed our departments to look at 5, 10, and 15 percent cut, it is not a unilateral that every budget is going to get cut by a certain percentage. It is, it is meant to, as I shared in our last budget, you know, community budget meeting, that, uh, again, these things that David has outlined in terms of our strategic priorities – there is a through line um, that you want to have happen strategically, even in, in budget downturns. Um, and so it may be that it's 5% over here, but 15% someplace else to, to make sure that that equity priority can come, come forward. So I just want to reinforce what you're hearing from David this evening, um, that that is top of mind for us. Uh, these are not unilateral cuts regardless. Um, it is done through the lens of equity and certainly with community um, awareness and input. Thank you, David. Yes, thanks, Dr. Sue. The other thing um, to validate that is, and I can share a little uh, glimpse of what you might see Tuesday night, but our uh, internal team has been working over the last few weeks and we'll meet again tomorrow. And um, all of the, the equity themed investments have been prioritized as priority one or two. So in that 25 to 50% range, so uh, everything related to community engagement, 
and uh, our culturally responsive specialists, our, our, our family advocate specialists, our contracts with our um, outside groups like uh, REAP and, and ERCO. And um, so we've made a, um, our recommendations will include um, all of those investments in the first two tiers. Um, does that help, Jimmy? But I added to what Dr. Sue said. Yes, it does. And thank you both very much. And then um, as far as um, other feedback related to the general fund, uh, we haven't developed a, a calendar for um, what it's going to look like going into June and July because it's, it's probably going to be coming hot and heavy, the new information. And likely what we'll be doing is, is sharing updates with the, the community in its entirety, including the, the, the budget committee related to um, what the total impacts are to Tiger Tualatin and how um, the district is proposing to move forward with um, look at any, any program and budget adjustments. The other thing uh, that we'll pay attention to is, is our district priorities framework, which we developed as a reset to the, the five-year strategic plan last summer with a focus on uh, social and emotional learning, uh, cultural re respons culturally responsible teaching and learning, and human capital. So we'll keep uh, those things at the forefront, too, as we're um, developing district priorities when it comes to, to budget adjustments. And I always like to show Dr. Sue's um, coherence framework uh, circle. And um, I've neglected two years in a row to mention this specifically in the written budget message. And I apologize for that, but I, I have come through with the, the budget message being delivered to the budget committee the last two years. So just to remind everyone, and I can't do justice to this, she can, um, talk about it in her sleep, but um, the key part is, is the instructional core there in the middle where you have uh, how the student um, is impacted by the teacher and, and the content, and you, the teacher uses content, content to impact the student. And probably just as important are the, the outer rings also, the theory of change and strategy um, from an overall district uh, basis. And then on the outside ring, you have uh, the systems and structure and the stakeholder groups like you and our SIA work group and um, culture and, of course, resources to impact that instructional core. So, um, like I said, Dr. Sue can do it much better justice than me, but um, I wanted to at least mention this because it's part of our, our district, pro district priorities and our, our guiding principles. Let's talk about reserves. Um, so our board policy DBDB um, requires certain level of reserves based on our operating revenue in the general fund. In, in the current proposed budget, we have operating revenue proposed of 150.88 million. And it looks like I forget the million there. It's more than $150.88, I guarantee you, not meaning to scare anyone. Um, so uh, the three elements of the board policy are 2% for operating contingencies. That becomes part of the appropriation. So if, if we had something that uh, resulted in, in us having to tap into that during the year, the board could act on that during a regular board meeting and move those dollars over to another appropriation level. Uh, we have 5% for unappropriated ending fund balance and then 5% for a sustainability reserve similar to the, the state's rainy day reserve. And then in addition to these reserve levels in the proposed budget, and again, this is on our, our pre-COVID budget, um, we have uh, $1.5 million uh, reserved for the Art Reckon Elementary and the same dollar amount reserved a year ago. Uh, for the current year budget. So um, those those amounts add up to total reserves of 19.6 million. I'm going to uh, direct your attention to the actual document too at this time. Uh, pages four and five 
of the printed document or pages 38 and 39 of the PDF. Um, just to run through quickly the general fund column, which is the, the far left-hand column of numbers that summarizes the, the revenue, the expenditures, and the, the fund balance reserves. And um, you should see a total of 150.88 million in total operating revenues in the general fund. And then we have um, 157.3 million in total expenditures. So this budget is reflecting a drawdown of reserves in, uh, proposed for next year of 6.4 million. And um, I'm going to pause there for a second to see if anybody has questions at this time. So we're projected uh, back to uh, a question earlier about whether adjustments to the state school fund in the current year have been taken into account in this budget. Uh, where they're taken into account is um, the beginning fund balance estimate for 2021. And right now we're estimating a beginning fund balance. Uh, that's the other number that's in that, that column, that left-hand column in the general fund. That, Estimate currently is 26 million. So um, if we're um, starting with 26, projected to end with 19.6 based on this budget, that's a drawdown of 6.4 million. That's where those numbers come from. So, David, I do have a, a quick question here. Um, sure. That seems to be somewhat correlated to the potential. 6.5 million based on 800 million shortfall from today's number. I mean, was that just coincidence or? No, it's coincidence, total coincidence. Got it. Good observation though. But that would mean ultimately that the shortfall would be double what we're projecting right now, correct? From a, yeah, from a, the matter of, um, Without realigning the budget. Current operating revenue is being short to meet the current operating expenditures. Uh, correct, yes. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about reserves and the history um, going back to the, the Great Recession. Um, you'll see um, between 08, 09, 09, 010 era, we were spending down to where uh, in 2012, 13, that actually was my first year in the district, uh, we drew down reserves um, to uh, about three and a half million dollars or about 6% of our operating revenues. And then we slowly started, you know, coming out of the recession, we slowly started to build them back up. And we've seen increases every year uh, through 2018, 19. In addition to the history, we're showing some projections for the current year and then um, the budget amount for, for next year. And you'll see a new trend of um, the dollars um, on a projected basis going down. We started 2019, 20 with actual reserves of almost 28 million. We're projecting that it, it at this time we have a, a lot can happen between now and June. We run a lot of payrolls in June to, to close out contracts for the school year people. Um, but right now we're projecting an ending fund balance of 26 million. So that's a spend down of, of, of 2 million approximately in the current year. And then you see uh, the further spend down based on the budget budget in front of you for 2021. And um, that's about um, the 2021 is actually, it's going to be a little bit over the 12% because it includes the, the one and a half million also on top of the 12% for art reckon. Um, so just something to keep in mind as we um, consider solutions for a shortfall. Um, the other thing that I didn't mention about the economic forecast update that, that ties into this topic of reserves is um, 
Kristen mentioned the shortfall uh, of 2.7 is what was reflected uh, for the current biennium, 2.7 billion. And they also gave us projected shortfalls of the next two biennia. And they were, um, I think one was almost four and one was over four billion. So um, that's related to that, that um, recovery timeline that we looked at earlier, where we're looking at almost mid decade before we get to the same level of jobs that we were uh, working with in, back in February. And um, there will likely be, you know, a lag in revenue before we, we lag in time where revenue recovers. So we're, we're likely looking at, at a, a forward, of, if, if not a five-year recovery overall. So we need to be strategic about any um, thought of, of how we use reserves over the, the next several years. One more quick question, um, and I was looking for in the document, but maybe you could just refresh our memory. What was the budgeted ending fun, uh, ending fund balance for reserve? For yeah, we, we talked about that within the budget uh, message, the written budget message. It was, uh, I believe it was 18.4 and 18.8. So we ended up, uh, we're projecting to end up um, with about seven million dollars more than what we budget as reserves uh, in the current budget, and that is due to a number of factors, both on the revenue side and the expenditure side. And those are outlined. I uh, wish I had a page number for you, but they are addressed under the reserve section of the written budget message. And those are everything from. Adjustments, Megan earlier asked about adjustments to the current year state school fund. There was an adjustment of a million dollars to the current year state school fund. There was an adjustment to a million dollars to last year's 2018-19 state school fund, which is always reconciled the following May. So we just got that number recently. Um, we have health insurance savings uh, based on um, choices that our, our employees make related to their health insurance plans that saved a million and a half dollars uh, compared to what we budget for health insurance based on incentive programs that we provide for those that opt out of the benefit. Uh, so those are some examples of what makes up uh, a portion of that, that seven million. Um, question? That question that Corey just asked actually segues into a question that I had, if you don't mind, are, are you good, Corey? Sure. Okay. Um, so those, I've seen the same um, cost savings over the last few years um, with the health savings and the unfilled positions. I was curious if um, instead of having those large cost savings each budget period, if there has been a change in methodology for the budgeting on those items um, going forward, or if it's... Um, just not something that can be foreseen. Yeah, we we refine the way we've uh, budgeted health insurance. Um, it used to be a much higher number than even one and a half uh, the last couple of years. And um, the tricky thing is, is um, in addition to just the paying the flat premium for health insurance benefits, the other part of the benefit is, is for those employees that choose to opt out because their, their spouse has other coverage. Uh, we, we give a benefit of 50% of that savings uh, to the employee. And um, during some time frames, there's a good trend where we can estimate that. Um, I wouldn't recommend that we change our practice in the current era because we don't know at, at this time how many employees have spouses that are out there in private industry that have been carrying the health insurance that maybe have lost their jobs. But the, again, I think that's something we want to look at long term and keep refining that number. We've come a long way to where that difference used to be and we've closed that gap. And but we want to we don't want to overstep our bounds and and get too aggressive with that because uh, then it, it can come back to bite us. And then the other one you asked about, I believe, was uh, 
position openings. Um, and um, many of those are in hard to fill positions on the, the operations side uh, with custodial and, and maintenance staff. And with our collective bargaining agreement that we um, updated uh, at the beginning of this year, we made some changes and some intentional moves to increase um, salary levels for those positions. Uh, they're still in, in time of a, a high flying economy. Those positions are very hard to attract because uh, especially those people that work in trades, there's, there's better opportunities perhaps in construction out there to make a better wage perhaps. And so that's something we need to continue working on how to um, look at that more closely and determine how it might impact our budgeting for those positions going forward. That's all good questions. So let's talk a little bit about the, the special legislative session and the timing of that. Now, um, the Revenue Subcommittee heard the, the forecast update for the, the June second quarter this morning. And um, other questions they'll have to consider are use of state reserves and whether um, they want to wait out if there's uh, a potential package of additional federal revenue coming to the state. Um, so if, if, if there is a waiting uh, time frame for that, it could delay uh, the session until late June or July, perhaps. Um, and then when we have, you know, in the meantime, we need to be working on a plan to develop um, how we're going to uh, narrow the shortfall that um, based on the estimate we have currently and going forward and uh, determine how uh, we might consider different scenarios for um, adjusting um, our budget based on any adjustment to the state budget, including the state school fund. So next steps, um, first uh, for the committee, um, just to quickly review, the committee um, will take public comment, and I believe we do have some public comment this evening that came in ahead of the meeting. Um, and um, then the committee deliberates on the budget. And um, just to remind everyone from the, the motion that you've been provided, a proposed motion you've been provided a copy of, um, the committee's charge is to. Um, approve the budget amount in total. I believe it's 471 million plus. And also approve um, the, the property tax levies and amounts. Um, we have our permanent property tax levy that must be approved by the committee in addition to the local option levy. And then to repay debt service, we have an actual um, dollar amount to be levied to, to repay uh, the principal and interest on our, our bonded debt. Um, so the other reminder is, is it's not uh, the committee's uh, responsibility to, to discuss program and give input on program. Um, and uh, we understand how it feels weird to be considering a budget that may not have real numbers. But what this budget current in its form, in its current state does is develop uh, or, or propose a ceiling on spending. Uh, it isn't necessarily needed to come back later to reduce the budget when we actually learn what that actual state school fund resource is. It, it could be a possibility, but it's not required because we already have um, the uh, appropriations or the um, the budget committee in total set by the budget committee and then um, however we do have a placeholder for additional meetings for the next two weeks if it's determined after deliberation that the budget committee wants to come back and deliberate more perhaps after uh, receiving um, more information upon request from the, the district 
Um, however, if if the committee did approve uh, tonight, uh, we would uh, move forward with publishing a summary uh, of the budget in the newspaper and announcing a, a public hearing uh, for June 22nd and um, the opportunity for any stakeholders to, to, to make public comment on the approved budget on June 22nd. And then also as part of that same um, venue that evening, uh, the, the board would consider adoption of the budget. And then going forward, um, as I alluded to earlier, uh, the district will continue adjusting and balancing the budget based on our actual resource and uh, determining a, a plan, a contingency plan for spending. And this could happen um, based on when the actual timing of that legislation, legislative session might be, it could be at any time during the summer that we'll, we'll have a, a final plan to, to recommend and, and implement. Before I open it up to any final questions, I want to uh, give closing and gratitude. Um, I really appreciate um, all of our community engagement, even though we had a, a um, interrupted um, cycle. Uh, we didn't get to do our full um, budget community work group process, uh, but I appreciate all of you being part of the, the session uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, and also want to thank publicly our, our SIA work group and SIA planning team that put the priorities together so we could submit that application to the state on a timely basis. And um, always appreciate uh, the board and the budget committee and your involvement with those processes and the board's leadership. In addition to Dr. Sue's leadership, uh, with the budget process. Um, the finance team gets to meet with her every Wednesday morning at eight o'clock and, and gracious that she uh, provides time on our calendar for that. It's a, it's a great partnership to have when the, the finance and the, the teaching and learning side work so closely together. And also want to um, for sure uh, thank Elizabeth Michaels for the those of you that don't know, she puts together um, the uh, the numbers behind the budget, and she is going to be um, finishing her career here in a few more days. And uh, we hate to see her go. She's been um, not only is she a, a tremendously hard worker, but she's a great historian for the district. We always know who to call on when we have a question about something historical related to the budget or related to a bond issue or whatever, whatever it happens to be. And um, we hate to see her go, but we're happy she gets to go forward and, and enjoy life in other ways. And finally, Amber Summers, who's on the call this evening, taking notes uh, for this meeting. And she's responsible for putting together uh, the PDF document and the printed documents and uh, being our, our communication for all of you. So those are my thanks for this evening and uh, my closing. And uh, I'm happy to answer any other final questions before you begin deliberation. David, is that Octavio? Yes. I was hoping that we could address the contractual increases that, that I brought up earlier today. I haven't, I haven't seen anything about that. And uh, I'm interested, I'm interested because I realized that we, we, the teachers are union and I realized that, that there's agreements that are already signed or agreed upon in the private sector. There has been reductions in, in pay for people um, mm -hmm. in hours. There's been reduction in all levels. And so I'm just interested to see what potential, potential um, a, a reconsideration from the unions or the teachers of 
not moving forward with some contractual increases. So I'm just, just curious. Yeah, so um, Octavio, those will be, that's part of that, um, back to that slide where I, where I said there's going to have to be staffing and personnel decisions. And so we haven't um, got into that process yet. Part of it is that we're waiting for the news today on the economic forecast. So um, those discussions will happen. And um, right now, whatever we have in, in the budget document as a placeholder, we do have a contract with the classified group. So um, there may be some hurdles there to address any um, reopening of that contract, but that's that's a consideration. If, if it's, it's something that could be um, doable for us. So um, yes, there will be conversation about contractual increases. Thank you, David. I got a question, David, this is Kristen. Um, I have two questions. Um, I can't remember what page it's on, I didn't mark it, but um, there was a notation in the budget that that we're still anticipating the state school fund 2018-19 and 19-20 closeouts. So I think there was like a million dollars each expected for both of those. It, does any of this change that or do they have to remain true to the closeouts for previous years? I just wondered if if, if the current circumstances change what we're expecting in that area? So 2018-19, that's done. That's been fully reconciled. It has been. It's approximately that when we round it, it's, it's, it's about a million dollars. Yeah. 2019-20, uh, remember, well, that's not going to be reconciled till next May. So right. that number could change in the future year. Thanks. And then so far, so far, there's been that million dollar adjustment. And then my, my other question is, it, it is, I mean, I know this is, a, this is a weird time to be looking at any budgets, right? Like on, on this day when, when news just came out about what we're expecting. But I also wonder, as I'm sitting here thinking about our role, what is the likelihood that, that we would have anything different to look at in a week or two? I mean, I, I know we have good information now, but I know that the district has a lot to do with that information and a lot of decisions have to be made. So I'm just trying to guess, I guess, from my position, weigh the utility of having further meetings against, against you know, the possibility of having additional information within our role, which is not to recommend program. Right. So, yeah, there won't likely be um, concrete information over the next couple of weeks, partly because really everything won't be set in stone until the, the legislature convenes and, and makes the actual decisions related to state budget. Again, I said some of the information we, we learned today was a starting point, um, and um, there are some of those things that still have to be reconciled. What's the difference between a $2.7 billion shortfall and an $800 million? So there's those questions we don't have answered yet. David, um, I have a question, and I'm not sure if it's one that I should hold to the budget deliberations or if I should just ask. I'm just going to ask you. You can tell me where it should go. Um, so as I was looking through the budget earlier, um, what are the anticipated impacts to items such as the district fee structure and out-of-pocket costs on participations in clubs and athletics? And with impending shortfalls, is this more or less impacted by our budget deliberations, or is that not something we should look at? Are you asking about the, the student fee? conversation yeah so well, and yeah so um we had the the student group that did the the project as far as surveying students on, on fees and impact on participation so um and we had them give an update at the budget community work group meeting two weeks ago 
And right now, um, you know, I guess it's the board's prerogative, but from what I understand, there's going to be continued conversation going into next year related to that because there's some other pieces that haven't been focused on, including um, the impact of other um, outside private athletic groups and um, middle school participation and fundraising. So there's a bigger, there's a bigger piece uh, to the overall conversation. And we've committed to continuing conversations uh, going into to the next school year. But as of now, there's no change to the budget related to the, the to the fees and the board will consider uh fees uh for next year including student fees uh probably at the the june uh the second june or a july board meeting hey, thank you so much yep David, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to be sure everyone was aware. I accidentally originally sent out last year's motion as this year's motion, so it's been corrected on the shared drive. I just wanted to make sure everyone had the right information. Thanks, Thanks Amber. Amber. Any other questions? Thanks everybody for listening this evening. Hopefully it was informative. Hey, sorry, David. I was struggling to unmute myself. Oh, um, Ben. Question. So just so I understand this properly. So if, and when we adopt this budget, um, moving forward as, uh, you know, new information comes from the state and we have greater clarity about what the numbers are going to look like for future bienniums, what will the role of the budget committee be versus the role of the school board? Um, and how will those two entities work together with that new information? Uh, as far as the budget committee, there's no, there wouldn't be any requirement to reconvene the budget committee because you're in likely we're going to be spending, um, developing a spending plan to, to spend less than what's been approved in the overall budget. And, um, but we're committed to keeping the budget committee and, and all stakeholder groups informed of what um, changes or recommended changes to the budget are. And for sure, as part of that, the board and um, their you know, typical, you know, I, I, I can think of, um, you know, three or four summers where there are adjustments since I've been here uh, to the budget. Um, in those cases, it was an increase in dollars, um, but it didn't, you know, we probably used contingency or something like that to get it folded in the budget. We didn't reconvene the budget committee. It was done at the board level. And um, there used to be a, a county level revenue called gain share revenue that we, um, received over a few years and um one year we didn't learn the outcome of those dollars and we hadn't budgeted for it so it was somewhat of a windfall but it, it was came to us in in august and so we you know i think we with those dollars we added classroom teachers at that point but we did it within the appropriations were sufficient including you know whether we use contingency at that time or not i don't recall but the appropriations were sufficient where it wasn't um, necessary to, to reconvene the budget committee. And um, so there's that's one way you could do it, or um, you could go through the process of um, doing a supplemental budget to reduce the budget, which doesn't doesn't make sense to me, but if, if the budget committee wanted that level of involvement, um, that would be you know up to the entire budget committee. Um, to determine that. Thank you. The board and the superintendent. That's helpful. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Thanks, everyone. Okay.
Um, next on the agenda is public comment um, for, let's see, um, for virtual meetings that public comments have been submitted online. Public comment requests were accepted until 6.30 p.m., the beginning of the budget committee meeting. The public comments will be read during the public comment portion of the budget committee meeting. Public comments or statements by members of the public are limited to three minutes and should be brief and concise. Um, I don't believe the next uh, speakers may offer objective criticism to the district operations or programs, but the board will not hear complaints concerning specific district personnel. Public comment that was submitted online will now be read. We have one comment. Yes, thanks, Megan. Um, I volunteered to read it, and it's from Mark Dobson. Um, it is a please budget funds. We're beginning to integrate the use of Khan Academy in classrooms. Open your minds to accepting new technology that has been proven to improve learning. Current test scores prove that the old ways are not working. That's the end of the comment. Okay. Um, I believe the comment is more programmatic in nature and um, wouldn't be specifically addressed during this meeting, it would be um, covered by the board, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, if there are no further public comments, um, we can begin the committee deliberations. Um, budget committee members wishing to comment, um, if you could, um, speak now. So I have a question. So I have a question. So I, I think I understand that we are still waiting for some numbers to come through from the state on what our final dollars are going to be to be able to allocate towards our, our budget. But we are being, we're asked to, today we'll be gonna, we're going to be asked to put a motion forward to approve our budget. Is that correct? Yes. But we don't have all the information yet. Right. So the budgeting schools in Oregon. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I get that. <laughs> I, 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 it's difficult to make a decision on something or put a vote to something that we don't have quite all the information yet. And I understand that. Um, but we are, when will we have that information? I, I know you probably spoke about it, I just didn't capture that information. So my understanding of it, Octavio, is we will get it in dribs and drabs over the next several months. It could be as late as August um, before we have a really clear idea of all the bits of money that we're getting. So the budget that we're talking about approving tonight is really would be, say, a ceiling. We can't spend more than that amount. Well, the real reality of it is we're going to spend a whole lot less than that. Um, because we don't know what that number is. And I think over the course of the summer, we're going to see it go up a little, go down a little, go sideways a little, and come around a few times. And, you know, what's going to happen with the SIA money? We don't know what's going to happen. You know. And so this is just, here's a ceiling for us, and we'll end up spending somewhere down here. It just gives us a framework, if you will. Thank you. And I can add to that. I mean, I'm sure, David, I'm sure you have talked to folks too, just working statewide in my day job. I think boards, at least that I have talked to right now, because of the awkward timing of this, their their budget committees are doing, are, are seeing the status quo budget, right? Nobody has updated anything to, to go along with today's numbers. And, and then the board is going it, to, it's the board's job then to refine that over time. And I, I but I, I think that most districts that I have talked to are are operating this exact way. Yeah. That's correct. I might, Octavia. Uh, there is also another school of thought relative to um, the um, confederation of school administrators, superintendents across the state, that from an advocacy position relative to the upcoming special session, that if we were to budget below the nine billion, it might give them an, the opportunity to say, well, clearly you can operate on less. 
um, versus this is what it truly takes uh, for a district to operate. Um, and, you know, board members and, and many of you as well helped us advocate to get us to $9 billion, uh, plus the SIA dollars. And so I think it is from, a, from an advocacy position um, to be able to submit a budget that is at the $9 billion, knowing, again, that it, it will probably be much less than that, um, uh, is a point to be considered. And Octavia, this is Maureen. I um the only thing that I would like to add is what I'm hearing you say is, as Dr. Sue mentioned, all of our budget committee members, you all have been highly engaged, care deeply about how our resources are allocated and spent. So what I hope is through this process, um, while we may not have an official uh, budget committee convening and process, uh, because what you're doing tonight is, is approving a recommendation to come to the board for adoption, correct? Um, but that we engage in that conversation uh, together. And I think that's the, the, the thing that's important. I mean, the ultimate decision does um, rest with the board. We're, we are the ones that would adopt that. But I think what's most important is that we have that opportunity uh, to have this conversation and inform you and talk about some of the um, decisions, which will likely be um, unfortunate decisions. Um, and, and that's what I care about is hearing your voices and engaging in conversation. So thank you. Thank you. It's a great question. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I, I'd like to add that, you know, given given the current situation, um, in fact, we're, we're looking at a placeholder budget process and that mm -hmm. the committee is basically shifting this placeholder um, budget forward to the part of the board who ultimately make the decision. Um, so if if we have any particular comments that that need to look at uh, to, to have the uh, the board look at those comments? Then, of course, we could make those here and then carry those up to the board for their uh, particular deliberations. Correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, I do have one other question. So, I have we, we were emailed a motion to vote on okay is this the appropriate time to ask questions about the motion ask away yep <laughs> just, just for just for clarify i'm sorry my screen froze so i was pausing because it froze everybody had a happy smile and it didn't move anywhere so <laughs> okay so before we put the motion forward so yeah okay so we're looking at 4.98 and change per 1,000 of assessed value of operation amount, right? Of $1 per 1,000. I just need some clarification on what, what that is. So I can address that. Thank you. So the, the four point, if, if you go back to um, that worksheet of the state school fund that I mentioned included a local property tax, element. Um, so local property taxes are assessed through the, the local uh, county taxation and assessment office. And so those dollars come, come directly to the district. And, but they're an offset to the formula. So every dollar of property tax we receive local, we get $1 or less through the formula um, from the state. So the 4.98 is our, our permanent tax rate um, back in the, the late 90s under 97, ballot measure 97, uh, revamp of the property tax law. Everybody got a permanent tax rate that they could assess at. And um, so our rate every year since, since then has been 4.98, $4.98 per thousand. So that's what brings in the dollars that serve as an offset to the state school fund formula. The $1 is our local option. So that brings in about nine and a half million. That's a that's an optional levy that the voters have approved. And that's outside of the state school fund formula. It's just an additional revenue line item in the general fund. Brings in about nine and a half million dollars a year. And then the other piece of the motion is for this for the bonded debt service that we owe on each year, our principal and interest payments. Uh, that's a dollar amount that's assessed each year in the form of a levy. And uh, 
it's always budgeted sufficiently on the revenue side to cover uh, the principal and interest payments. Yeah. And that's and, under local budget law, the budget committee is required to approve those amounts yeah. every year. And Octavia, the only thing I would add to that is again, the, the dollar, like David said, the the um, the permanent rate is capped, so is our levy. We would have to go out to the voters and ask for a higher levy, which many districts actually do have a higher um, for those that have a local option levy, many of them have a higher rate, but we've stayed conservative in that regard and maxed it a dollar. Thank you for that. I was concerned a little bit about it, but after hearing uh, David talk about it and your clarification, thank you. Good questions. Hey, Dave. Uh, David, can I, I don't know if there's any information or analysis about this yet. I was um, talking to Maureen about this this morning. Do we have any sense of how the all the approved ballot measures for the primary um, election, uh, including the city of Tigard and Metro, if we're be approaching compression territory and if that will impact what we're able to collect, um, do we know yet or when will we know? I haven't heard anything. Uh, the one soundbite I have heard about property taxes, there doesn't seem to be the same concern with um, the amount of property taxes being collected under this recession compared to the Great Recession. And um, I'm not hearing specifics about impact on property values, which could impact our, our local option. Um, all I know so far is it seems like houses are still selling immediately. So uh, the market's still hot. Who knows what the longer term impact might be. So no news is probably good news on that front. Yeah. You guys are slamming us with great questions tonight. I love it. So I don't have any questions, but I, I do just want to say thank you to everyone, uh, David, Elizabeth, Amber, everyone who's spent, I mean, I can't even imagine scenario planning and tireless hours, everything that goes into this. So, um, and, and all the unknowns and have, this is, I think my third go around now. So I think I pretty much understood everything tonight. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, so anyway, I just wanted to express my thanks to y'all. And, um, you know, it is, I mean, Octavio, I'm kind of with you. It's it's hard to approve something that feels so uncertain. And what's nice, particularly in my experience, and I've been involved with the community meetings for several years now as well, is that it's probably the best group of people in the state to be managing a, a school budget at the moment um and you know clearly we we've, we've been people first in the past and i imagine that that's going to continue both students and teachers and administrators and and everyone so i don't know i just while it's uncertain i have a lot of faith that the school board's going to make uh, um the right decisions when it does come time to figure out how we're going to have to trim you know, Corey, I can't, I, we, my wife and I specifically moved into this district with the understanding that we had a very solvent and good process. And then we intentionally were trying to be part of this committee. Um, I'm super interested on what kind of concessions, because in the private sector, everybody's making concessions. And so I'm hoping that the our partners and the union side and the teacher side i don't even know if that's even properly correct even say that i, I don't know this is new for me but i'll learn it as i go along <laughs> if if they help us because obviously we understand that people need to make a living and people need to prosper and but everybody has pain okay and in the private sector it's been painful for everybody to even take pay cuts hourly pay cuts cutting hours per load you know forced to take vacations i would anticipate that our partners in the district, when the union, I don't think it was the district, I don't know, would understand that. So I would, I would bother me that they would be steadfast to adhere to what was agreed upon in the past without knowing what came to the future, which is this COVID thing. So I'm just, that's kind of where I'm sticking a little bit to that. Thank you for making that. Uh, Octavio, 
wish to just put maybe a little, a little more emphasis on, on your point there. Um, whatever we need to do relative to working with our associations in terms of uh, potential concessions, uh, depending on what, what the future holds, it starts with your superintendent. And so whatever needs to be done, I will model that um, and ask my administrative team and our administrators to follow suit uh, as part of uh, the leadership that's necessary when you have to navigate these difficult times. I've done it before uh, during the Great Recession um, and prepared to do it again uh, because, you know, the, at the end of the day, the instructional core and keeping the instructional core whole um, students and teachers and our ability to deliver education, that is our primary mission. Thank you. I would, I would add that, that uh, one, one of the key values and one of the key components in any labor negotiation process is to maintain uh, open and transparent communication between all the key uh, and core stakeholders. Um, we all know that, that this is something that we have not seen in our lifetime, uh, maybe our parents' lifetime, uh, but we certainly have not seen it. And everyone, I believe, is um, is is unsure as to, to how we proceed in, in whether it be a city municipal budget or whether it's a school district budget. Uh, but what makes this work is holding on to our shared values about where we want to go as a district and how we want to get there. If we've walked this particular pathway um, thus far in, in, in close collaboration, then we need to just continue that process as we go forward. So I totally appreciate your, your question. Um, I've been on both sides of that discussion over my career, and so I know that that's an important piece because we do all, as they say, we all are in this together, and we all have some measure of pain. So thank you to everybody else as well. I, I've been very impressed with this, uh, with this process. And Jimmy, to that point, I would uh, also, as a reminder, <clears throat> that uh, beginning last week, um, I've started uh, videotaping, recording um, weekly updates, uh, both for our staff um, or on a variety of, of topics, including the state budget. Um, they will get a second recording, um, an update on Friday, and then the community gets one the following week. Uh, it went out yesterday from last week on, on Tuesday. So please be looking uh, for those. If you are not on our text list, um, please make make that avail, make, make us aware of that, and we will make sure that you get those notifications. Um, but you can also look to our main web page, and you will see uh, updates from me now on, on a weekly basis uh, to make certain that we are being as transparent um, and uh, providing uh, in-the-moment communications as we can be, given the, the fluid nature of, of navigating the reopening of Oregon, as well as now navigating um, state budget. Are there any more topics that the committee would like to discuss? Okay. Um, shall we start a vote on um, whether to approve the proposed budget as it stands? Um, the vote will need to be a roll call. And we need a motion first, Megan. Oh, oh thank you. I move the budget committee of the Tiger Tents. 23J, Washington, Clackamas County, Oregon, hereby approved as proposed budget for the 2020-2021 fiscal year in the sum of $448,725,000 for, for all funds now on file at the district. I further move that the Budget Committee of the Tiger Falls School District 23J, Washington and Clackamas County, Oregon, approve the taxes provided in the proposed budget at the rate of 
dollars at ninety eight point thousand value. Too many, too many decimal points. Um, for operations, the amount of dollar per thousand foot value for multiple option tax for general school operations and the amount of twenty-two thousand twenty-two million six hundred thirty thousand two hundred for general obligation bonds. Sorry, I botched up the number. Got through it. All right. So we will go through the roll call. If you're in favor, please say aye. Uh, Director Bowman. Do we need a second? I think I'm second. 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 Megan, we need a second. Thank you. Thank you. This morning. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay, now we will begin. Uh, Director Bowman. Aye. Director Zershman. Aye. Director Emerson. Aye. Director Wolf. Aye. Director Fox. Aye. Corey Morgan. Aye. Jimmy Brown. Aye. Kristen Miles. Aye. Octavio Gonzalez. Nay. Okay. And Megan Madlam will be an aye. Okay. All right. So it looks like we have the necessary votes to approve. Um, the, the budget as it stands um, without any further meetings from the budget committee. All right. Dr. Sue, did you want to um, do any formal comments and wrap it up? Uh, all I have to say again, how grateful I am to each and every one of you uh, for uh, helping us deliver right this evening and provide, uh, as always, uh, food for thought as we move forward. Um, again, uh, please uh, know that your input is 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 highly valued. Um, I also want to say thank you to each and every one of, of the TTSD uh, board members who shepherd um, this on, on a yearly basis with us and help us make good programmatic um, decisions. Um, and I certainly want to say a special thank you um, to CFO David Moore. Um, a hearty um, congratulations to Elizabeth Michaels and profound thanks. If we could unmute for a moment so she can all. Yay! Yay! Um, we miss you and we welcome Sarah um, and to the fold and uh, Quite a quite a baptismal fire for you, Sarah. Uh, coming, coming into yet another great organ recession, um, and and to Amber Summers and to all of the TTSD um, fiscal staff, as well as my cabinet staff um, that work on your behalf uh, to be good fiscal stewards with the dollars that we have. Um, and so, with that, I um, thank you all um, for your deliberations this evening. Um, for helping us to deliver um, an approved budget. And we will certainly keep you abreast uh, as, as conditions change. Uh, and uh, would really encourage you uh, again to uh, check out the uh, either Monday or Tuesday link uh, to the video where I will provide uh, weekly updates uh, as, as we move forward. So with that, uh, Chair Madeline, thank you for your service this evening. Um, and I believe that brings us to an adjournment. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. Have a good meeting, everyone.